Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're happy you could join us for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. Give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. Our phone volunteers will be glad to help you. If you've got pictures or you want to send us an email, that address is byf at unl.edu. Tell us where you live, please, and give us as much information as you can. Those are on a future show, not on this show. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook. Check out our video features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. Kate, we had, oh, 20, 100,000 questions about your sample? Maybe 300,000, okay. something like that. <laughs> um, so today I brought some larvae of the brown-headed ash sawfly with me. And if you have an ash tree here in eastern Nebraska, you may be seeing these by the hundreds or the thousands. And although the larvae, there's one right there, Although the larvae do feed on the leaves of the ash tree, um, usually you don't need to do any management. If you have an older, well-established ash tree, these, um, they bounce back fairly easily. If you have a younger or new ash tree, you shouldn't because emerald ash borer still exists. And the good news is that if you've treated your ash tree for emerald ash borer, you also have less problems with the ash sulfites as well. All right, and there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. <laughs> All right. Okay, Matt, that's a tiny little uh, yeah, something. Yeah, we got a little baby nuts edge uh, coming out of the ground already. So it's getting close to that time of year where nuts edge is gonna become more popular in your lawn because we're heating up and we're getting more moisture. If we do get more rains on those dry areas, we're gonna see this nuts edge plant pop up. And this one's little, so usually when they're coming up like this, they're coming out of a tuber that was from last season. And if we wait, let's say another month, they're gonna start forming new tubers underground that'll replenish next year's nut sedge crop. So some of the options that we could do now would be to, if we know we have a problem with yellow nut sedge or we're seeing these little plants come up, we could actually treat now. Sooner is better than waiting till the plants are really big because by that time they're already gonna create tubers and they're hard to control. So something like sedge hammer or uh, a product containing sulfentrazone, which is both foliar and root absorbed, uh, would be something that if you know that they're coming up, that would be a product to use. Or so. pull them? Well, you can probably try and pull them, but they're gonna set out new ones from that tuber most likely, so. All right, thank you, Matt. Yep. Okay, Amy, that time of year for pines. I know, pines don't look good anywhere, so we're gonna bring some death and gloom here. So this is a pine that's on campus. Um, I really wanted to point this out. This is Seropsis or Diplodia tip blight. And what's really nice about this sample that I found on campus is you can see what the needles were last year. As you can see, this was last year's growth and they died. And so Seropsis or Diplodia is going to attack those new candles that are emerging. But the really neat thing that I saw about this sample is you can look at it on the side. We have new needles trying to come out and new candles. I'll go over here a little bit more. And you see how those candles are just starting to come out. This is the time you would actually want to spray for it as, as those candles are emerging because the spores are going to go from these dead ones over to these new candles. And so this would be the time that we do the uh, fungicide application. The other big thing with this one, I do have a cone attached to this sample, but I also have a sample of a cone here. This is the other place that we're going to have the inoculum. If we look at look at our cone and all those little tiny little black dots on there, those are actually fruiting bodies also of Seropsis and Diplodia tip blight. So these cones will stay on a tree for a couple of years and so there's a prime opportunity for infection to occur. And we're gonna see it on an older pine. So just to take a look for that and, and spray start spraying. with? There is, coppers is probably one of the most common products that you're gonna spray. But the trick with your older trees is we actually have to spray it from top to bottom and to drip. So most of the time you're gonna have to hire somebody to do those applications because you're not gonna reach it with your little pump sprayer very well, 50 feet in the air. All right, thanks Amy. All right, Elizabeth, you have pruning shears and half dead something. Hey, you know, I've got the fun sample of the evening. <laughs> um, so that time of year, if we have those trees that haven't leafed out yet, how do we know if they're dead or they're alive? And so what we wanna do is we wanna take one of the branches, if they snap off readily, that means that branch is dead. If it's very pliable, 
that means that that branch is still alive and it could still leaf out. So right here we have an area where there's both dead and alive on this branch. So if we leave this dead portion on here, it's gonna snap off eventually. So we wanna make sure that we make a clean pruning cut with sharp, clean pruners. Um, I like the bypass ones. And we're gonna do it right in here where that dead and alive is located at. We're not gonna leave a nub out here cause that's not gonna do us any good. We wanna make sure to make a nice clean cut down at the next branch union. Um, um, and make sure to take out as much as it's dead as we possibly can right now in this time of year. But if it hasn't leafed out by June 1st, it's not going to and you need to get pruning. Exactly. All right. Thank you. All right, Kate. First round of questions uh, is for you. This first one comes to us from Hastings. And the, the question is, this is the underside of a spinach <coughs> leaf. And he's wondering what kind of bug left these eggs? My very best educated guess is stink bugs. And if it is stink bugs, it's going to be from the green stink bug. And those ones will feed on nuts and seeds and fruits, um, but not really an issue in a backyard garden. So you can just, you already took the leaf off, so just let it hang out. <laughs> All right, yeah. and hatch it and see what happens. Hatch it and see what happens. All right, one picture on this one also. This is a hoot. Oh, I love this it. is a Prague, Nebraska viewer. Just thought she would share the rare potato spiders she caught. And she did say that when she showed her nine-year-old, she tried to Kool-Aid man herself <laughs> right through her bedroom wall. <laughs> Apparently thought it was a real spider. I love this. It even has like the little spider eyes. I know. It. And, and Great. clearly not a real spider. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, two pictures on this one. This is real. This is a Lincoln viewer uh, and wonders what this pupa is from. Seven-year-old son found it in some wood mulch uh, that's been in place since last year. It's wiggling. He wants to know what's going to emerge and does he want to let it and live in the garden. Yeah, so this is one of the hawk moth pupas, sometimes called hummingbird moths, sometimes called sphinx moths. Um, but usually when we think of moths, we think of that silky cocoon, but hawk moths tend to have, I call them naked pupa, so they use the soil as protection. And when it comes out, it'll just be one of those big bodied moths that will feed on nectar, visiting flowers. And at this point of its life cycle, it's not gonna cause damage. So it'll be a nice lesson on metamorphosis if you guys watch it come out and grow. Excellent, thanks, Kate. <clears throat> All right, uh, Matt, your first question comes to us with two pictures. And um, this is, what is this? This is uh, a couple yeah, of, the there we go. So yeah, the first one looks like poison hemlock, and then mm -hmm. I had to defer to find this one, I guess, with uh, a little bit of help from Kim. So I think it's uh, wolfsbane, mm -hmm. and it's gonna actually grow, elongate from here, is what it sounds like. It's a perennial that's native to more of like the mountains or northeast uh, mountain range, and it's not native to here, but it, both of these plants are fairly poisonous, and this one, I guess, is really poisonous if you get it on a cut or something. So if you're trying to remove these, you wanna wear gloves and long sleeves and make sure that you're not rubbing them on your skin or getting them in your eyes or mouth. Um, just to remove them would be the best thing. Or if they're not in an area where they're a problem, I guess you can let them grow. So the, the poison hemlock question, just to follow up on that again, is um, re they're wondering whether the soil itself is compromised by poison hemlock or by the wolf spain. Do they need to replace the soil? Mm, I, I, that is something I don't know, and I wouldn't think that it would be in the soil unless you leave a lot of the root system in there and you plant something, let's say, directly near that. But odds are there's enough microbes in the soil that it's going to break that down and not be an issue. It's more the plant itself. So I guess I don't know the for sure answer on that one. All right, thanks. Two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a Northeast Lincoln viewer, and she's calling this grass in quotes. Uh, in the fence line, now it's hidden by the regular grass, a little onion below the ground. Is this a friend? Is this a foe? If it's a foe, what do we do? It's a friend if you like to look at those green patches early in the spring. Those usually grow first, so yeah, wild onion. And I wouldn't personally want it in my lawn, but it is a pain <laughs> in the butt to control. Uh, some of the methods that have been found to work are 2,4-D, like dicamba, and MCPA. MCPA, I think, is the other one. Uh, so Trimec is one that has those three in it. And 
if you apply early in the spring, like right when they're coming up, or late in the fall, and that's the best time to control them, not in the middle of the summer, obviously. All right, thank you, Matt. Amy, mm -hmm. uh, this is a question that actually came into the Douglas Sarpy office, and it's about clematis, and the question from the person who said it was, is this a virus, or what is this exactly? This isn't a virus, this is actually a varietal component of this clematis, mm -hmm. so it's the way it's supposed to look. Right, and this is sweet autumn clematis, and they will they'll do that every yeah. now and then. How would, how would the viewer know if it was a virus? Um, the big thing with the virus is if if you look at the new foliage, it doesn't have that stripe pattern on the inside. If it was a virus, they would continue to show those symptoms on that new growth. So that's the big thing to look for. And the other trick with viruses is usually the the plant isn't as thrifty, and so it's it's going to be wimpy, wimpy. That's that's the best way to explain it. And so those would be the indications that we're looking at a virus. All right, uh, three quest or three pictures on this one, Amy. This comes to us from Loveland, Colorado. Um, Arborvita, and one of them is looking poorly. So here's the environment. It's on the north side of the house. This one's smaller. It's always been smaller. A lot of heavy, wet snow that she did shake off. She has trimmed this out, but she's wondering what's going on here. Okay, it, it's a great question. And looking at it, it doesn't look uh, pathology-wise. I would lean toward environmental. Um, maybe some winter desiccation, but the color doesn't look right. Where it was at, it shouldn't be salt injury. But you did or make the comment that it's smaller than everything else. Maybe there's something going on with that root system that we can't really see as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's root bound or something like that, which would inhibit the movement of water and make it more prevalent, prevalent to winter injury. So if you're really concerned about it, maybe pull it out and put a new abravite in there. All right, and one picture on this next one. This comes to us from Elkhorn. Uh, we want to point out that uh, measuring tape there. And what is this? And are we jealous? I am super duper <laughs> jealous. That is a six inch morel by the looks of it. Holy cow, that's going to feel like two people in your household, depending on who you are. Um, just a trick on those morels. I know Lauren talked about it last week. Make sure you cut them in half to make sure you have a true morel and not a false morel. False morels will be solid on the inside and they are poisonous. True morels are gonna be hollow on the inside. So even though on the outside, you still wanna cut them in half to make sure they look good. All right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, three pictures for this first one. Uh, this yeah. is a Northeast Lincoln and ash trees were replaced in 2017 with red sunset maples. Did fine, but about two weeks ago, started noticing huge long splits in the bark on opposite sides of the trunk interested about the cause, the impact on the health, and what can be done. So um, what can be done right now, there's not a lot we can do once it's already happened and those cracks are there. We wanna leave those cracks open to the environment. We don't wanna seal them or tape them or tar them or do anything along those lines. In terms of what can cause it, um, we could have some environmental stress, whether it's a frost crack um, or sun scald where that light is hitting that during the winter months. Also, sometimes, um, you know, if that plant wasn't treated nicely when it was dropped off the truck, sometimes we'll have some shearing injury on the interior of the tree and then it takes the right opportunity for it to come out through the bark. Um, so about the only thing you can do is make sure that that tree is in overall good health, uh, provide that supplemental irrigation which it's getting probably from the lawn around it and just wait and see. Hopefully that tree will be in good health to seal over those wounds. They're always going to be there uh, but hopefully it'll cause some callus tissue to seal it up so it can take some water and nutrient on the sides of those cracks. All right, thanks. Two pictures on the next one. Uh, this is an Elkhorn viewer. Uh, two red buds planted 2021. Same nursery, same people. One's been beautiful from the beginning. The other one has been struggling ever since. She did use Super Thrive in the fall and twice in the spring. They're about 30 yards apart. Baby or replace or what do we think about the, the, the management? So the one that doesn't have any blooms on it, doesn't have any leaves on it, I would probably go out and test some of the branches if it's brittle and snaps off, 
we're probably looking at replacement. Um, it could have something to do with how it was planted or the planting depth on those, why there's a difference between the two. Um, at this stage of the game, there's not a lot we can do other than wait and probably replace. And probably fertilizing when they look like that is not gonna do any good. So we don't want to fertilize our stress trees. Um, adding fertilizer to stress trees has them put on more growth than what they can sustain. So we really don't recommend fertilizer for any tree, especially those that are gonna be stressed. Water's just gonna be the key thing that we recommend. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, for our first feature tonight, Scott Evans and Dana Freeman from the Douglas Sarpy County Extension Office will talk about mulch. They'll show you the importance of proper mulching and what kinds of materials make the best mulch. Spring's follies showed up in Nebraska and we're out in our landscape cleaning it up and getting it ready for the season. And one of the things that we like to do is mulch the landscape, but Dana, what are some of the benefits of mulching? There are a lot of benefits to mulching, Scott. Beyond the aesthetic purposes, you know, mulch makes our landscapes look nice and tidy, but it also helps suppress weeds, especially our annual weeds that we battle. Um, it also helps uh, keep our soils moist, um, keeps evaporation at a minimum. It also keeps our soil temperatures cooler in the summer. There's also a nice way that you can widen the interface between your turf and your, especially your tree beds, and then the mulch can also widen that space and provide uh, protection from our string trimmers and our lawn mowers. So Scott, do you want to tell us how we go about mulching our landscapes? One of the things when we're mulching the landscape is we need to remember that we don't always have to use landscape fabric. Fabric is kind of a feel-good item, but it's really not doing anything for the environment. If you're worried about any of those weeds popping up, just put down a couple of layers of newspaper and then the mulch on top of it. When we're mulching our plants like our trees, we need to remember mulch trees like donuts and not volcanoes. We don't want to mound the mulch up against the trunk because that can cause issues down the road. So go out about 18 to 24 inches, as much space as you want to give up, and about two inches thick. When we're doing our perennial beds, we're following the same practice. We're going to just mulch it about inch to two inches deep and go out as far as we would like to. And it just really helps make the um, landscape look a little bit cleaner. Dana, what are some of the different types of mulches people can choose from? Sure, we tend to recommend organic mulches, and that means products that break down in our soils, that sort of recreates the forest floor. So we recommend things like hardwood mulch. Stay away from your cypress mulch, something that mats down. You can also use your grass clippings if you don't mulch those back into the lawn, but they need to not have been treated. Um, so give it some time before you put those down. We also recommend straw, especially in our ve vegetable gardens. It has a bit more of an agricultural look, but that doesn't matter so much in our garden spaces. Um, and then there's other products out there that are interesting, cotton holes, um, cocoa mulch, lots of different products. We'd say stay away from the river rock, those things that don't break down in the soils, um, but because those tend to get hot in the soil. And remember, when we're outside in our landscapes, getting our gardens ready, remember we're doing donuts, not volcanoes for mulching. Organic mulch does so much good for those trees, shrubs, and garden beds, including breaking down, adding that organic matter to the soil. Pick the right one and use those tips to apply it properly. None of this around the tree trunk. All right, Kate. Uh, one picture here. This is an Omaha viewer. It's uh, do you know what these insects are? They they took this actually last July in Omaha, so we like those pictures from last year, so we know what to do. They snuck into the house, but they often swarm. Yes. So this is most likely a non-biting midge, and if I had to guess, you probably lived near some body of water whether it be a lake or a creek, because similar to mosquitoes, the larvae of these are also aquatic, so that's where they're coming from. And even though they don't bite like mosquitoes, um, we do see them attracted to lights. So really the best thing you can do to prevent those swarms is keep that porch light off, close the blinds in the evening. 
Um, there are sprays you can do around the house, similar to what you would do to mosquitoes, but it's really not practical or sustainable for long-term control. All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, two pictures on this next one. And this is um, a, a beautiful stand of Phlox paniculata, and this is a white one with a red eye, which is the garden Phlox. And then this just happened to the foliage. He's puzzled, and what can he do to treat this insect that is sucking on the leaves? So this looked like um, symptoms of uh, Phlox plant bug feeding. I have to say that slow every time. Phlox <laughs> plant bug. Um, and the good news is um, it has two generations per year, and right now this first generation is very small, so it's a great time to treat. You can use something like an insecticidal soap or a horticultural oil, but the key here is that they like to spend time on the underside of the leaves, so you have to be really thorough in getting that pesticide everywhere. Another important aspect about fox plant bugs is that when the growing season is over, cut back those stems, get rid of the, the leaf litter because that's where they're going to be overwintering. All right, thank you, Kate. Your first one here, Matt, comes to us from Brownville. He wonders, can we identify this grassy weed which is growing profusely among the daylilies and how do you control it? Yeah, th it's kind of a tough one to tell what it is just by looking at it in this picture, but the closest thing I come to would be like woodland sedge. It almost looks like it's got that sedge leaf on it. So um, I would guess that it's a weed, uh, but that one doesn't spread by rhizomes or stolons or anything. It kind of just makes a bunch and it just gets bigger and bigger over the years. So treating that one selectively with Roundup, if it's in that case, uh, would take care of it. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. And this is uh, this little weed. She's had it before, but not mm. in the hundreds. Germinates early in the spring, little white flowers, and she wants to know the name of it so that she can curse at it more yeah. meaningfully. <laughs> Water pod, and yeah, it's pretty prevalent all over. Um, I've seen it usually in wetter areas, but it, it doesn't always favor the wet areas. Uh, so this one is a summer annual, so treating it, most herbicides work on this, any broadleaf herbicide works on it. Otherwise, they pull out really easy, so just hoe them. Uh, you cut them off at the top and they won't regrow. So pre-emerge or I don't know. It's a bigger seed, so pre-emerge might work if you use some sort of landscape pre-emergent, pendimethalin or something like that. But uh, I would guess it might grow through if it's a little bit bigger seed. I just found out last night. This is also called Aunt Lucy, so she Ooh, can curse well, out yeah, Aunt Lucy. She can call me. <laughs> as long as she doesn't have a real one. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, uh, one more picture for you, Matt. Uh, and this is a viewer in Council Bluffs. It says these have been coming up for several years. Pull continuously. Seems invasive. What is it? And she thinks it's Asiatic date flower. Yes, and um, I agree, that's what it is. And it is uh, kind of invasive because it grows very fast and it produces a flower for a day and then it makes a seed. So if you had it last year and it produced a lot of flowers, obviously you're gonna have a really good seed bed. It's actually an annual. Uh, so just getting rid of it up front or treating it, same thing. Most broadleaf herbicides work pretty well on it, but just be careful with those surrounding plants when you're treating for it. All right, Amy, uh, this is an Omaha viewer, Barberry. Mm -hmm. Two pictures here, he thinks it has verticillium wilt, uh, and then he's he's wondering about, he planted some barberries in the resultant hole, then he's seeing wilt and dead branches again, including on the new plants. So the soil, the verticillium, what, what do we do here? Okay, I appreciate you taking a picture of the cut stem so we can actually see the uh, vascular system of the plant. Um, that's very helpful on this. This is verticillium wilt. Um, it is uh, a pathogen that's in the soil. And if you're in the Omaha area, verticillium is very common. So there isn't a lot of management options available because it's in the soil. So my best recommendation, don't replant a barberry in there because obviously it is susceptible. You want to look at something that isn't as susceptible to verticillia wilt to replace that barberry. All right, and tear out anything that's got it. Yep, anything that has symptoms. All right, uh, three pictures on this next one. This is McCook, Southwest Nebraska. This is a weeping juniper. Rusty on the south, or not, excuse me, she said juniper, it's a spruce, sorry. She mm -hmm. said juniper, I said spruce. <laughs> she's, she's, she lost her shade. Uh, she's wondering, is this sun scald? Is, what's going on here, do you think? So I spent a lot of time looking at this 
it, you know, when you first look at it, I was leaning toward a needle cast, but there isn't any s signs that would indicate a needle cast. If it was needle cast, would we see all these little black fruiting bodies on the underside of the needle right where uh, the stomas are at? Um, it could be a sun skull because they do like partial shade. The one nice thing I did see with this is it is trying to shoot off a bunch of new, new growth. Um, but also in the previous picture, you saw a lot of cones being bearing on this tree. It's an indication that it's stressed. So we're looking at environmental stress. So you're gonna wanna baby it, make sure it's getting ample water. If you can provide it a little bit more shade, it's gonna make it a little more beneficial. I know you can't overnight create shade, but um, baby it along and see what, what happens from there. All right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, uh, one picture here, but we had two people who sent in the same thing. This is Decatur. What are these growths at the top of the rhubarb and what do we do about it and why did it happen? So that is your rhubarb starting to flower called bolting. Um, it happens when we get to this time of the year and it's starting to get warm out and that rhubarb is gonna send up that flower stalk. Um, just pull it out. Um, that's gonna be your best removal. And how about this next one? This is a uh, cauliflower that got planted three weeks ago, developed a head. Can this be saved? And the foot is for comparison on the size. You know, uh, we, we always appreciate anything for size. Um, when it comes to those coal crops like cauliflower, broccoli, any of those, we really want to plant those much earlier in the season if we can. Um, if it's only been planted for three weeks, we're starting to push that outer edge of being too hot for some of these coal crops. My guess is, is even if you were to try to blanch it and make a head out of that, um, it's not going to do very well because it's just going to be too hot. All right, uh, one picture here, and, and we actually got several about ornamental grasses. This is five-year-old Carl Forsters that are barely showing any life. We can see a little bit. The spring is different. What is causing these to struggle? We saw a lot of it across the state. We've got a whole bunch in central Nebraska too. Um, it's just the environmental conditions this last fall and winter that we had. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can really do to make those grow and make those have any new growth on them. Um, so if there's no new growth on any of those ornamental grasses, go ahead and remove them. Or if there's just very little and very sparse and you, in order to have a full landscape, you're probably gonna want to remove and replace in those instances. We're being reminded this year that we are actually not in charge. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right, well, we have had our plants ready to go for a couple of weeks, and we finally got a beautiful day to get our garden started. Here's Terry James at the Backyard Farmer Garden to tell us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, as you can see, like we said last week, plants are in the ground. We're pretty excited. We still have a few more to plant, but we are well over 75% done and we're super excited about seeing green in the garden again. Remember how we plant the bottom half of the Backyard Farmer Garden where we're mixing both vegetables and flowers together? So you can do that at home if you only have one or two tomatoes or maybe a couple of tomatoes and a couple of peppers. Go out, find a little bit of color at your local nursery and just tuck those underneath those plants and you'll be able to add a splash of color in your garden for the rest of the season. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and see how we're planting. Right now it is time for the lightning round. All right, Elizabeth, you are up first. Are you ready? Sure. Sure. Your first lightning round question is, is cocoa mulch a good idea in the landscape if you have dogs? Nope, it's not a good idea. It can be toxic to dogs, so it can attract other dogs from the neighborhood as well. All right. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer who had a 10-year-old asparagus patch, has been managing it. It's getting smaller every year. He has been putting the ash from his smoker on it to give a little bit of a boost. Is that a good idea? No. Nope. I would try some compost or some other kind of organic matter and not the ash. All right, uh, and a viewer has said, is it a good idea to burn off the asparagus every year to, to give it a boost? You don't necessarily have to let it stand and have some winter interest. All right, this is a Hampton viewer who had wine and roses Wygelia, rejuvenated it six years ago. It's looking pretty sad. Can they go ahead and do that now? It's good to be a little late now to rejuvenate those, especially since they've already started to leaf out. 
All right. Um, this is an Omaha viewer who wants to know, is there an environmentally safe way to kill English ivy on a fence? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Prune it off. Prune it off. You can use a herbicide selectively, but it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to continually do it. All there. Right. Okay. There's a full answer. <laughs> that one doesn't count. Oh. <laughs> All right. Are you ready, Amy? <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, unfortunately, Nebraska had hail again. And what could we expect in terms of pathogens related to hail damage? So. Um, I showed seropsis or Diplodia tip light. That's going to be really common uh, for many damage and can cause a canker on all of our pine trees if they were severely damaged. That's be the big one I'll be looking for. All right. Uh, apparently, we have a lot of smoke coming down at us from Canada right now. What issues or what should people be looking for? So remember last year we had a lot of smoke also. That smoke is gonna prevent the UV light from penetrating and so we can see some yellowing of the plants just because lack of photosynthesis. But it's also a prime opportunity for pathogens because we're not going to burn off the dew. And so we're gonna have long periods of dew, more opportunities for pathogens to go like gangbusters. All right, uh, some parts of the state have been wet. What are the, is the prognosis for botrytis and peonies? So depending on where you're at in the state that received rain last week, uh, you're definitely gonna wanna be looking at putting some preventative fungicides down to protect those peonies so you don't get that nice black botrytis blight on your blossoms or prevent them from blooming altogether. All right, nice job. Are you ready, Matt? Oh yeah, we're gonna win this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make stuff up. Okay. Okay, <laughs> this is actually a Benson viewer who has a new lawn, uh, newly seeded, has a lot of weeds and is wondering whether pendimethalin or a 2,4-D product can be used on a newer turf <clears throat> to control the weeds. I think uh, for new seeding the grass, you wanna wait after two mowings to use anything with 2,4-D in it, or at least that like probably four weeks to five weeks after your emergence is up. All right, uh, we have a Kennard viewer who wants to know what is labeled for smooth brome to get rid of it. Smooth brome. Uh, tenacity actually works on smooth brome, so that's one of the selective methods to take it out of grass, and it works best in the middle of the year. All right. We have a Hoskins viewer who has bindweed taking over pretty much everything on their acreage. They're wondering if any product that we use to control bindweed will affect new young grass. Um, so if we try and c control bindweed with quinclorac, that one works really well, and it will not affect the new young grass if you're trying to grow it in. All right, we have a Greeley counter viewer who wonders how to control musk thistles in a large dry dam bed. Um, 2,4-D would probably be the product of choice. I don't think you want to use anything with graze on. If it's in a waterway, it could get through and go into the river or into the creek. Nice job. The other one I would suggest is milestone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's hey, labeled milestone. for water. Get out. Dig, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or not. All right, are you ready? Sure. Okay, this is a, a viewer who has been battling grubs for years and has been told that there was a big American elm that died of DED, Dutch elm, and wonders is, are the grubs living under there and they're just surfacing? Um, if it's the white grubs, they're gonna be feeding off of the turf grass roots. All right, um, we have, uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who says they had two very large bees that appeared to be chasing each other around the yard. What were those and why were they chasing each other? Um, I've seen a lot of bumblebees. It could also be carpenter bees and they're probably trying to get friendly with each other. <laughs> All right, we also have another viewer who saw a shiny half inch long green, she called it a bee, but a very shiny green Bee. Yeah, we have, um, it could be a sweat bee. Those are kind of metallic green or blues and they're very pretty. All right, uh, this is a Plattsmouth viewer who says, unfortunately, she has little tiny black bugs in the flowers of her peonies that are munching away on the blooms and ruining those. What are those? Little tiny black buds. I don't know. Well, you can call them little tiny it. black little bugs tiny because black that's bugs. what entomologists call things. Yes, that's probably its scientific name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. It's the no little seeing. tiny black yeah. peony bug. Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, what are our plants of the week? So we have some really nice looking plants of the week this week. Um, some of the ones that draw a lot of attention early in the spring are going to be these alliums or these flowering onions. Um, these are a bulb that you'll want to plant in the fall. Um, there's lots of different kinds, whether they're the white ones or the gigantic ones. Um, some of them will be a little bit shorter. Some of them are going to be taller. So lots of uh, variety um, and variability within the, the flowering onion or the, the allium family. Um, the other one that's really fun that, that um, was brought in was this um, butterfly bush. And it's not the, um, the common butterfly bush that we think of, um, the divinii. Um, this one is alternifolia. Um, and this one is going to be a bigger type of a shrub, uh, like its name, alternate. And then also uh, the cool part about this one is it doesn't have the same issues of winter dieback like um, Davidii div does, <laughs> the, common, the other one, um, and it only blooms once a year. So it's really fun and it's blooming at this point in time of the year. Wide range of soil conditions can handle dry, can handle, handle um, just so many different soil conditions. So it would be a fun one to go ahead and try. It's good for zone five. Um, and then the other one is gonna be our Ajuga. A really fun one grows low um, and then sends up these really fun flower spikes. So lots of really variety or variability in the plants of the week this week. And if you could smell the butterfly bush. Uh -huh. Yep, I might just leave it here all the rest of the show because it's a good smelling one. <laughs> all right, thanks Elizabeth. All right, Kate, um, one picture here. This is a Lincoln viewer noticed a swarm of small black flying insects around the large ash trees. Today they've seen thousands covered. And then you have a second picture, which is this tiny, tiny little green worms and poppy seeds. And then we have another picture. And then we have another picture. And then we have another picture. See, it was an, ex <laughs> an exaggeration. And there are, no. that first picture, there's hundreds, if not thousands of caterpillars out there. Um, so the adults are brown-headed ash sawflies, which is a stingless wasp, which is probably those little black flying bugs that you saw. The black little poppy seeds are probably, well, they are the larva's excrement. Um, we can expect to see these um, going across the state maybe until early June. And if, I know, <laughs> and if you wanna um, kind of reduce the populations that you're seeing, because they can be a nuisance, honestly, like get out the shop vac, vacuum them up, sweep them up. Really, you don't need an insecticide because a lot of them are going to die anyways, but um, there's a lot of people that are pretty annoyed with them being um, and raining on them in their porch, so yeah. just an option. All right, excellent. And I think, let's see, your next picture here is a Grand Island viewer. Good guy or bad guy? I think it's a good guy. This is one of those sphinx moths that we had mentioned earlier. Maybe it's the kind that came out of that pupa. This one's called a white-lined sphinx moth, um, and they are nectar feeders, so they're going to be visiting flowers. Um, the caterpillars feed on like grape, apple, tomato, and that's about as many facts as I know about them. All right, and I think you have <clears throat> yet one more of the worm showing the damage. Yes. Yep, they, um, they will defoliate the trees, but as I said, those older, well-established trees bounce back pretty easily. And one more, it's Insect Central, and this is an Antelope County viewer, came across this worm Saturday after the rains. Concerned this is an Asian jumping worm. I don't believe it is. Um, you can tell Asian jumping worms um, first by their behavior because they make very rapid, almost jumpy motions. And then they also have a white clitellum, which is that little band that you see on earthworms. Um, to my knowledge, Asian jumping worms haven't been found in that county, not saying that they're not there, but um, I wouldn't have any concerns. And if you did, there's literally nothing you could do about it at this point. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kate. Um, let's see, Matt, two pictures on this first one. This is a Norfolk viewer wondering what is this grass and then what uh, should be done to control this grass. Mm. And this looks like it's maybe just a Kentucky bluegrass plant out of place in a tall fescue lawn or it's just a different variety, like a common forage type. And it's seeding out. So different varieties seed out at different times of year. So that's kind of what this looks like. And for control, if it's just one, dig it out. If you have spots of them, you could treat with a non-selective product uh, such as glyphosate, but you might have a nice brown spot dead in your lawn. So I'd say just pull it out if there's one. 
All right, uh, one picture on this next one. This is a friend, Nebraska viewer, planted grass this fall and has this weed all over the newly seeded area. What, what and what? Yes, and this one to me looks like downy brome, and that one is very popular when you have a new seeding, especially in the fall, because it just thrives in that open soil conditions. And it's it's somewhat of a winter annual, and it can also be a summer annual. So it probably came up last fall, and now you're seeing it in your lawn. And it should die out when the temperatures get up into the 90s or mid-June, late July. Uh, but just keep mowing it off, and don't let those seed heads uh, come out and spread more for you. All right, and we've seen some in seed already around here. Yeah. Two more pictures, and this is a Fairfield viewer. Uh, this grass is in the middle of the yard of tall fescue. The patch is about a four foot circle, wider blade with a pretty big stem. Uh, so this one looks like orchard grass because it's kind of a flat stem, and you can see that the leaf sheath kind of comes up behind it with that little white uh, elongation. Uh, so that's what I'm leaning towards with this one. and. It's a perennial, so you're gonna to have to kill it with a non-selective herbicide because there's really no selective herbicide to use uh, for this specific weed. All right, thanks, Matt. Amy, three mm -hmm. pictures on this one. This is an Omaha viewer. Um, this is the young persimmon tree that he had, and then it just looked terrible, terrible, terrible. Black ooze coming out of open gashes. The ooze then disappeared over the winter, has not come back. What is this and what should be done? So, you know, you look at the black, but you look here, there's a huge canker there, damage of some sort there. Um, at first, I really be thinking that it's just oozing and weeping and it's turning black because we have other fungi coming in and eating all the sugars and that's what's causing it to be black. But I am really concerned about the size of this canker. Um, I don't know how long the tree's gonna survive just because of the damage. And I, Elizabeth, you're gonna have to help me here. I can't remember how much of the percentage of the tree, if it's impacted, it should be removed. So more than a third, and it really depends on if you're gonna have that good callus tissue on either side to seal over that wound. If it's able to do so quickly, you know, it's got a better chance. Okay, thank yeah. you, I couldn't remember. That's unfortunate because persimmon's a pretty cool tree. It is, I, it just doesn't look real healthy. No, and then uh, two pictures here. This is, uh, she was on a neighborhood walk, the first uh, two different mushroom species. So she's got this one, and then the second one was a day later, same spot after a good rain. Any ideas on these? So the first one, I couldn't come up with a name. It's, it kind of falls in those little brown mushrooms, uh, feeding on dead organic matter. This one's pretty neat. This, is, this does appear to be ink caps. Um, with that nice black coloration. Once again, it's just feeding on dead organic matter. They're very short-lived, nothing to be really concerned about or need to treat. And don't eat them. Yes, don't, <laughs> don't eat any of these. <laughs> the only one to eat is the morels that I talked about earlier. <laughs> All right, thanks. Elizabeth, uh, you have uh, two pictures here. This is a bargain Japanese maple 20 years ago purchased. It's done all right. Uh, obviously not grown for Nebraska, but starts out with beautiful classic reddish purple Japanese maple leaves and then it goes green. Wants to know, is he, can he do anything to keep it red? There's really nothing you can do to change that color, that foliage. I would question if, if that foliage that's turning green is in more of the shaded areas as to why it's reverting and going more green because it needs more chlorophyll. Um, but there's really not a whole lot you can do and just enjoy it the way it is. All right, uh, let's see. I think your next picture or pictures here, this is another Japanese maple and he's wondering, I think this is Omaha. What about that top? Anything dead, damaged or diseased can be removed. So. It might not be much left, but they can go ahead and prune out anything dead. All right, three pictures on this next one. This is a Cozad viewer. She's wondering what's happening to the tree. The, you can see the whole tree here. There are bare spots is where the bark is kind of peeled off. And then she's kind of got a close up of that bark issue going on. So some trees will have exfoliating bark, um, but we really don't have anything disease wise. So, I mean, we could have a creature, we could have a kiddo, um, just something causing some damage to that bark that's causing it to kind of rough off. All right, so keep it healthy and 
keep the critters away or the kids. If you can. <laughs> All right. Well, ants are a part of our outdoors and sometimes the indoor world. Most of the time they're harmless, but there is one species that can cause some damage to wood structures, including your home. Let's hear from Jody Green about carpenter ants and how you can keep them from munching on your house. A lot of ants of concern here in Nebraska, in the garden, in the house, and in the landscape. But the one that we're going to talk about today are carpenter ants. We get a lot of questions about carpenter ants because they are wood destroying organisms and they have the potential to break down things that are of structural value in our houses, in our yards, our wooden fences, gazebos, pergolas. So let's talk about what to look for when we're looking for carpenter ants. So most people know what an ant looks like. They're insects that have a pinched waist. So they have three segments that are easily distinguished. And with carpenter ants, they have a single queen in their colony and she's the one who lays all the eggs. There are other ants that have multiple queens, but a carpenter ant colony only has one. And so in order to get rid or eliminate the colony, one has to treat the nest directly and kill the queen. In order to tell a carpenter ant from other ants, you want to look at that thorax. So there's the head, thorax, and abdomen. They have an evenly rounded thorax. So when you're looking at it, it is a perfect semicircle. It doesn't have any bumps and it doesn't have any spines. It has one node between the thorax and the gaster, which we also call the abdomen, and they are quite large. If you could take a good picture of an ant, it's probably a carpenter ant because they are one of our larger ants. And we know that ants do swarm occasionally and that is when they are mature colonies and they want to disperse. If you see a large ant foraging and it looks like a carpenter ant, one thing to do is look at if it's got food and if it does, follow it back to the nest. That's how you can find the nest. You may also be able to find the nest because carpenter ants leave frass in the form of coarse sawdust. And so they may be in piles under wood beams or out in the yard. And that frass will also contain insect body parts. So carpenter ants do like sugar, but they also need a source of protein. And that is why normal sugar ant baits will not work. So you wanna find those baits that say that it treat carpenter ants. And a household ant is not a carpenter ant. Those are sugar baits. So if you're outside and you see carpenter ants in a nest or an old log or stump, you can leave it there. However, they do have a tendency to forage in like long distances for food. And if they're just coming in for food, you can seal them out with exclusion methods. If they are nesting in your home, that is when you do want to treat and you want to locate that nest and you want to treat it directly. Some of the behaviors of carpenter ants are that they can forage long distances for food. They may also have satellite colonies, so they may have different nesting locations. They are nocturnal, so if you need to follow them, and the best time is going to be in the evening. You can offer them a little bit of diluted honey or sugar solution and then follow them back. And if they're going outside, that means their nest is out there and you just need to exclude them. If they are going somewhere in the house, then you want to find that nest and treat directly. So just because you're seeing carpenter ants out in the landscape, it doesn't mean they have to be a problem. In order to keep them out of your home, reduce the moisture, the soil to wood contact, clean out your gutters, and don't let any of those trees touch your house. So as Jody said, you know, the simple solution is plugging up those outside holes, eliminating the moisture to control those carpenter ants. Check for those symptoms Jody talked about and you should have no trouble keeping them out of your house. You know, we have numerous videos focusing on insect appreciation and control at the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. It's really a great resource for you to learn how to grow your plants the right way, see what's current in the horticultural world, or control those insect and disease pests. Check it out after the show 
make sure you hit that subscribe button. We have two announcements tonight of interesting things. The first is the free composting demonstration. Nebraska Extension Master Gardeners, Pioneers Park, across from the Nature Center, Saturday at 10 a.m. And our second one is the 54th annual Monroe Meyer Garden Walk, June 11th in Omaha. So good stuff in the gardening world. All right, Kate, two pictures on this one. This is a viburnum problem. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer. The, uh, the viburnum has done this in the past couple of years. She can't see any insects when she unrolls the leaves, but perhaps they're too small. <laughs> yes, so this is likely caused by the snowball aphid, and those aphids are hiding behind all of that white wax that are inside the leaves. And so the important thing to remember about the snowball aphid is that they will lay their eggs on the twigs and the leaf buds, and those eggs will hatch at bud break. And so the best time for control is when those leaves are less than two inches long. You can do um, a product like insecticidal soap but once again, you need to do it when the leaf's so small because when they're in that curled leaf, they're protected. So usually you can just let it go, but if it becomes a big issue, you might want to think about treating. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is also a Lincoln viewer, infestation on a service berry. What is this and what to do? These are also aphids. I probably say this every time, but my favorite insects are aphids. <laughs> and these are woolly elm aphids. And even though they're on service berry, they're, um, primary host plant is actually elms and then they'll move to the service berry in the summer and what's interesting about these is that they are going to infest the roots and the crown of the plant as well and so um, because they're in those leaf curls it's going to be difficult to treat those but you can do a drench insecticide at the base of the plant to take care of the ones that are on the roots all right thank you kate all right, Matt, uh, one picture here for you. This is from Northwest Iowa, and this is a, she thinks it's a weed growing in a lot of areas in her yard, coming on in some new seeding. What is it and how to treat it? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a weed, and it looks like uh, knotweed, and that is some pretty young knotweed. So treating it, if you're trying to grow a lawn, um, you want to be careful which products you use. Uh, I'd stay away from 240. If you're not worried about a new lawn coming in, then... Uh, those products can be used. All right, uh, one picture on this next one. Uh, the question is, is this a plant or a weed and what is this? Uh, I think it's a weed. It looks like common mullion, especially if it's got really fuzzy leaves, which I don't know if I can see that in the picture, but uh, it's a biennial, so it starts out as a rosette and then the next year it shoots up along a uh, flowering stem that harbors a seed and it'll spread pretty prolifically, especially in your area, so I would probably remove that one. Mm -hmm. Considered invasive in yep. a lot of locations. Yep. All right, two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is an Omaha, showed up in her yard last year, came back this year. What is this particular weed? I'm not 100% sure on this one, but one thing that I found that's really close to would be sweet sisley. I don't know if that's something that is uh, in the area. It's a native uh, herb, um, so I'm guessing that is something that is probably not needing to be there, but I don't think it's a harmful plant. All right, let's uh, see. That's all you had on that one. I, I don't know that one. I don't really know what that one is. Well, I think it's a perennial. Well, you sure. need a sample. You need yeah. a sample, yeah. right? There's, there's a, a lot sample. of leaves that look like that, but that's that's the closest one I could come Darn to. Darn leaves anyway. Why do plants need them, as Kyle says? Exactly. <laughs> all right. Uh, two picks for you on this first one, mm -hmm. Amy, and this is a, uh, a smoke tree looking like this, 12 to 15 years old, first time it's happened. Okay. So we're seeing the brownage uh, dying back there. The first thing I would look for is a canker back on the base of the plant that could be inhibiting movement of water and nutrients. But the other thing with smoke, just like the barberry, it could be verticillium wilt depending on where you're at in the state. Um, smoke trees are susceptible to that. All right, one picture on this next one. Uh, this is a shroom growing on a linden tree in Dodge. Is it edible? It, to me, it looks like an oyster, but I can't guarantee it um, that it is edible. You need to make sure you get proper identification. The big trick with this is it probably indicates that you have heart rot that is occurring. That's when the mushrooms are coming out. So we're gonna be looking at loss of integrity of that tree. All right, and one more, and this is a platsmouth shroom. What's this one? It's a type of porous, um, very similar to the shell fungus that we'll see. 
Um, it's actually pretty cool. I couldn't ID it precisely on what it is. All right, Elizabeth, two pictures for you on this first one. This is a tree that has some limbs with no leaves. They've used fertilizer stakes, hoping we can tell you what to do about this one. Prune out anything that doesn't have any foliage on it, and we want to make sure that we avoid that fertilizer, especially on those stressed plants like That's that. That's actually a viburnum, not mm -hmm. a tree. So We still want to avoid fertilizer. They're exactly. not a heavy, heavy feeder. And prune out all that stuff. Prune out all the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, Howells, Nebraska. This is an elderly friend that gave the plant they don't know what it is, yellow flowers, pods in the summer. So this is a fun plant. It's called Thermopsis caroliniana, um, or one of those. Uh, Carolina lupine is the other common name for it. It's uh, in the Fabaceae family, has a really deep tap root in it. All right, very nice one. All right.